as Stephen Jay Gould himself famously said with regard to rerunning the tape of life, well, next time we did it, it would end up with probably animals and plants and things like that, but they wouldn't be in any way familiar. But in point of fact, when we look at the endpoints of evolution, we find that almost nothing is unique. And the reason is, of course, that things have evolved again and again and again. And this, again, is not rocket science. It's because they are very good adaptations. And I always find it slightly paradoxical why Darwin only makes, I think, passing reference to convergent evolution. And I rather think that it was as much to do with his emphasis, you think of the famous figure at the end of The Origin of Species, of diversification. What he wanted to do is explain how the biosphere was filled with forms. So the more different they were from his point of view, the better things are in general. Whereas convergence actually, if you like, reverses that idea and says, well, it doesn't really matter where you start. I'm terribly sorry. You're going to end up with a camera eye or you're going to end up with a compound eye. And yeah, you're allowed other sorts of eyes, of course. We mustn't be greedy. But if you're going to do proper seeing, one of those will do. Greetings, future fossils. Wow, what a week. This is the episode with Simon Conway Morris, esteemed paleontologist, evolutionary biologist, someone whose work I encountered first through Stephen Jay Gould's wonderful life. Simon is an erudite scholar of the history of life on this planet. And we get into some profound questions in this conversation. But before we begin, I would like to thank everyone who has been supporting the show on Patreon and also Substack, including John Kirk, James Fairbairn, Katie Kelly, Michael McRarty, Peter Backe, Roger Tunnis. I apologize for mangling your names. You and all of the other folks who are supporting the show, I thank you immensely. Fully listener supported, no paid ads. Okay, here's a deep, deep dive, far ranging conversation with Simon Conway Morris. Enjoy. Well, Simon Conway Morris, it's a pleasure to have you on Future Fossils. This this show is strangely less explicitly connected to evolutionary biology and, and paleontology than one would expect from the title. But whenever I get someone interested in these areas on the show, it's like a special treat for me. Very good. Thank you. So we are here today to discuss... And this is not, I'm not sharing the video, but I'm still going to show the book for no reason. From Extraterrestrials to Animal Minds, Six Myths of Evolution. Now, I want to say that my interest in this is rather selfishly focused on only a handful of these myths. Because I think that even though the things that you have to say about extraterrestrials and animal minds or the lack thereof are fascinating, that, that the thing that I admire most about your thinking and find most pertinent to my own long-standing questions about general evolutionary theory are more about the statements that you make on the constraints on evolution and the role of mass extinction in all of that. So just to set the, the, the sort of frame for this. Before we get started, could you give us a little bit of background? Could you introduce yourself and, and give us a bit of an autobiography, please? It will, it will be mercifully short. So my name, my name is Simon Conway Morris. For the confusion of almost everybody in the United States, Conway Morris is a surname. And then to add to the mayhem, it does not have a hyphen. So there we are. That's all. But on the other hand, the Americans, I have to say, have all sorts of juniors and number threes after their names. So I think we're sort of level pegging on this one. So I'm speaking from the University of Cambridge. I'm now retired, what they grandly call an emeritus professor. And I've been in Cambridge pretty well the whole of my academic career with four years in the Open University quite some time ago. And I've been extraordinarily lucky with the work I've done, especially on the Burgess Shale many, many years ago, and more recently in China and also Greenland and a few other places as well. So as as one gets older, bits and pieces of you begin to fall off. But on the other hand, one's mind sometimes becomes more wide-ranging. 
And in the last 10 years, I've been thinking about all sorts of topics like the ones you alluded to very briefly, such as why are there no extraterrestrials discussed? Or, for example, are animal minds really the same as ours discussed? But there are other areas to do with general evolutionary theory and areas of received wisdom, which, in my opinion, such as mass extinctions, might be, as we say in England, long overdue for a really good kicking or, more politely, re-examination. So just to unpack this just a little bit more, because again, this is just an area of personal curiosity. How did you become a paleontologist? What got you into this in the first place? Because I feel that there's often an interesting link between what animated a person to pursue a particular set of questions in the first place, and the way that they think about those questions, the way they've addressed them in their work. Well, back to Vienna and onto the couch. I mean, initially, it was when I was a very young boy, probably about seven or eight. And as a story I've told too many times, but my mum gave me a sort of stamp album in as much as it had sort of pretty pictures of extinct animals. And you had to transfer the stamps from the back of this little volume into the appropriate box. So I suppose it was mentally pretty demanding for my age. And we got through that. And that somehow triggered, I think, my initial and uh, imagination. And I became determined to become a paleontologist, for better or worse, from really about the age of 10, I think. So we used to go all around the country, even to places like France, and collect fossils, which we loved doing. And then subsequently, when I went to Cambridge to work with Harry Whittington on the Burgess Shale, I suppose that's a more immediate set of inquiries, which led me, first of all, to think that like Stephen Jay Gould, who may come up yet in conversation, that evolution was pretty well open-ended. But as my many early mistakes were revealed by people more competent than myself, especially with respect to the Burgess Shale, I began to think more and more about the possible importance of what we call evolutionary convergence. And that is the constraints on evolution. And then that, in turn, of course, has segued to all sorts of other areas of inquiry. And the great thing about this, as I've said many times in the past, is that as they say quite softly in, in some of the London clubs, none of this is my own work. That's all based on other people's. So it's much more reliable than what I can do. So it more seriously necessitates a vast amount of reading at high speed, trying to arrive at a sort of, if not a synthesis, at least a, a slightly uh, oblique view of some areas, as mentioned, of received wisdom. So a, a couple of things there. One is I'm delighted. I'm glad I asked this particular question because I'm actually working through one of those sticker books with my own daughter right now. Oh, great. And there is something really satisfying. Hers is dragons. There's something really satisfying for me as somebody who's, you know, a puzzler and really enjoys reassembling. That was like the thing about paleontology, where right? it was like finding how the pieces fit together. And so it's been fun to watch her initiate herself into, into that particular thing. It makes me wonder kind of, you know, the, the impact. And to that, you know, to the point of historical contingency, Right. And, you know, what is it? What are, what are these, these landmark events that then determine, you know, the future evolution of a system or are perhaps weighted too heavily in our accounting of that evolution? I think it's a good place to start to speak well of the dead and just say that I, as a child, reading Stephen Jay Gould, as I think a lot of people first encountered your name and your, your work mm. through his, and it's been one of the more interesting feuds in the field, you know, the way that both of you have, have become almost synonymous with these two different positions, these two different interpretations of Earth history and of life history. And this is where I'd love to invite you to, to actually dive into your critique of the first of these myths, the myth of no limits. And to give people a little, unfamiliar with this debate, a little bit of grounding for the common misinterpretation that, that you claim pervades the, the conversation around life history. Yeah. Well, actually, I should say in parenthesis that I, perhaps one part of my specific interest in convergent evolution was ironically triggered by Stephen Jay Gould in one of his set of essays called Bully for Brontosaurus, which I actually reviewed for a, for a London literary journal. And in that, in those chapters, I think he was talking about the Kiwi or something. He actually refers to convergence. And I, th I think it's fair to say that probably triggered a specific Interest. It wasn't the only one. There was at a conference years ago in Cold Spring Harbor where people were talking about similar things. So once again, there's not a shred of an originality in what I'm saying. And with 
with regard to the sort of limits, the constraints, if you like, versus convergence, they are almost opposite sides of the same coin. But very briefly, with constraints, I don't think in the end anybody would actually disagree about this because, you know, one's dealing with sort of physical parameters. And one of the examples I refer to briefly in my book is, is working in a fluid. Of course, we tend to think of water, but air is a fluid as well. But in the case of water, of course, there's a wonderful relationship between the size of the organism and its experience as to whether it's living in a technically a viscous medium or whether it's something which uh, it will engender turbulent flow. Uh, so whales live in what we call a high Reynolds number and bacteria live in low Reynolds numbers and so on and so forth. But the net result is that the experience in inverted commas is just radically different at either end of this. You know, it's, all, it's impossible for us to put ourselves into the place of a bacterium in terms of how it moves through this medium. It's utterly, utterly alien to us. But it's there. It's very well understood. And you can do very clever scaling experiments and all the rest of it. And this, I think, extends pretty well, you know, with regard to chemistry what are you going to use please who's available in a periodic table uranium well let's not bother with that but carbon yes please and also phosphorus and those two probably along with a few other things nitrogen yes please and so on really are essential and i think are irreplaceable and i would extend that argument really in as many directions as i care to take them and say that Ultimately, there are limits, for instance, to the intricacies of the symbiotic associations. And there's a wonderful example in insects, not preservable in the fossil record, because these are little bacterial hotels. And what they do is they provide a lot of sort of metabolic machinery. And why do they need that? Well, of course, these insects have decided to go down death's route and not suck sap out of a plant which is nearly all sugar that's bad enough some of these jokers actually go for what we call a xylem that's the water you know almost drinking pure water now who would go and do a thing like that but in point of fact there are trace amounts of nutrients and in conjunction with these bacteria and sometimes you have incredibly intimate genomic associations between the bacteria themselves that to my way of thinking is just an example which could be extended wherever you care to look as to the absolute limits of what ultimately is possible so i don't think there's any particular rocket science in that and the other side of that coin, so to speak, is as Stephen Jay Gould himself famously said with regard to rerunning the tape of life. Well, next time we did it, it would end up with probably animals and plants and things like that, but they wouldn't be in any way familiar. But in point of fact, when we look at the endpoints of evolution, we find that almost nothing is unique. And the reason is, of course, that things have evolved again and again and again. And this, again, is not rocket science. It's because they are very good adaptations. And I always find it slightly paradoxical why Darwin only makes, I think, passing reference to convergent evolution. And I rather think that it was as much to do with his emphasis, you think of the famous figure at the end of The Origin of Species, of diversification. What he wanted to do is explain how the biosphere was filled with forms. So the more different they were from his point of view, the better things are in general. He was trying to explain the origin of species. Whereas convergence, actually, if you like, reverses that idea and says, well, it doesn't really matter where you start. I'm terribly sorry. You're going to end up with a camera eye or you're going to end up with a compound eye. And yeah, you're allowed other sorts of eyes. Of course, of course, you know, we mustn't be greedy. But if you're going to do proper seeing, one of those will do. So there's two things in there that I find of note. One is the point that you make in this chapter, looking at various forms where they appear rather fully articulated. Like the first time you see them in the fossil mm -hmm. record, you've got a complete thing. We tend to tell this story, and we kind of broadly, as though there is a kind of incremental stepwise complexification of forms. And so like rather you say on page 11 of the hardcover, the shift towards relative simplicity turns out to be a more general feature of evolution. So, you know, I, I host this other show for the Santa Fe Institute complexity mm -hmm. podcast. I just had Caleb Scharf on that show. And we were talking about the way that much like you're talking about these, these metabolic symbioses between you know sap sucking bugs and the the germs that live inside of them that we have kind of become uh you know the end the endosymbiote of our technological infrastructure and that you know there's this this question about the decline in the volume of the human brain case over the last 50,000 years as we have you know sp invented writing and then computation and data processing and and so like 
you know, as we rely more and more on our our associations with other human beings, our embeddedness in a, in a social frame and in a technological frame, then if you think about evolution as ultimately a process of like dissipation or like people who talk about the minimization of free energy, you know, like mm -hmm. making the most of available calories then there's an inherent laziness in evolution. And so things are constantly looking to reduce themselves. And so you, it's like, I, you, I think you mentioned earlier in this, also the way that people were surprised, you look at like a jellyfish genome, and it's enormous. Mm -hmm. And then, you, so we were expecting that we would find the genomes of more so-called so advanced animals to be bigger, when in fact, they're actually much smaller. And mm -hmm. so there's... So yeah, so there's something about that, but then the, there's a, a paradox that I'm, I'd like to hear you explore here, which is that this is only happening by virtue of, again, the diversity of life forms means that you have the, you know, like even as the individual organisms kind of come into being self-contained and then winnow themselves down into mm -hmm. more and more efficient and interdependent forms, that the whole thing is getting more and more richly symbiotic and speciose over time. And so, you know, what, this is one of those things that seems to be true in a lot of the ways that complex systems science investigates this stuff that the historical fault in terms of like the flaw in, in people's way of seeing this stuff seems to be about a confusion between activity at one level of organization and activity at another level. And that there's always this tension where maybe, I mean, this is like rampant speculation, but one could imagine, were there extraterrestrials or if humans spread beyond this planet that one might imagine Earth itself becoming simpler as it involves itself in a more and more richly interconnected meta individual of like life forms cross pollinating between planets. So again, there's some nuance there that I'd love to hear you unpack about in precisely what ways we see evolution selecting for simplicity and in what ways we see it selecting for more and more diversity and more and more complex form. Mm. Oh, well, you've given me a vast amount to try and unpack. I don't mind that Please. at all, obviously. No, no, that's what we're trained to do, apparently. And I thought right at the beginning, Michael, I thought you were going to gently try and shove me towards an intelligent design argument. I knew you wouldn't be so naughty. And of course, I wouldn't even be interested in taking the bait. Thank you very much indeed. So I might even use words which are not allowed in public. But with regard, as you say, to the general notion is, and I think that would be a Darwinian conceit, is that things are cripplingly simple to start with. And by aggregation, they get more and more complex. And to a certain extent, that must be true. And I've written several places, you know, that once there were bacteria, now there's New York. Well, some people might choose another city, but that, that, that passed. But if you take a particular example I came across, which struck me very forcibly, this is to do with the eukaryotes, okay? These are the more complex cells, which are precursors necessarily of mouse cellularity. And then you look at their sort of genomic components, and you can infer from their living descendants what the common ancestor possess. And there's a whole bag of stories here as to where you you can work backwards into what the Ur form had and infer its genome. And of course, you can do cleverer things than that and indeed infer their genetic sequences and engage in so-called resurrection. So you can actually sequence something and put it back into an organism and see how it would express itself in an animal which has been extinct for 200 million years. It's all very clever stuff, I don't doubt. But the point is that if you look at these eukaryotes, in point of fact, they, you know, they've got everything they need right at the beginning. And of course, you can take that argument further back and uh, say, well, they came from prokaryotes. And some people say, well, that's a huge leap. But again, this would be a different conversation. Probably that's not quite as complicated as people think, in as much as you said yourself uh, that actually evolution is lazy. And one of the things it is very good at, and this is slightly obliquely to the main point, is co option and taking on board things which are hanging around for some other function. And we see this very clearly in the case of the prokaryote eukaryotic transition things like the cytoskeleton. But then again, the, the, the question is, to what extent do these things self-organize themselves? To what extent is there, if you like, a matrix of possibilities which predisposes organisms to configure themselves in a particular and isn't that wonderfully vague isn't that isn't that a typical cambridge academic talking at high table and i can't articulate it very much better than that but then given that we see 
or infer that the first eukaryote was indeed extremely complex. And I'm not saying you have to take that all the way back to the origin of life. I really don't know. I mean, nobody knows. You know, once you go past pre-Luca, nobody's got a foggiest idea for all intents and purposes. But linked to that, as you indicate, of course, is that, that relative simplicity you might identify, or I would prefer to say streamlining. In point of fact, is these things are dazzlingly more complicated, but you must be misled by appearances. So they might, as you say, with regard, say, to a sponge or a cnidarian genome, have maybe five times as many genes. And probably what they're doing is sort of almost on a one-to-one -one basis. You know, there's, there's Fred down the line. He's saying, oh, well, I'll, you know, I'll do that bit of protein. No, don't worry, old boy. Whereas in us, if you've got, you know, trillions of cells and you're going to do things like a brain for example, then you don't have time for the genome to wake up and do all the heavy lifting for you. It's done by all sorts of other mechanisms. You can't do it without the genome. But in particular, if you think of brain development as it happens, it's got some very intriguing similarities, as I also mentioned, though this seems a bit of an aside, but maybe not, to the way our immune system works, the, uh, the adaptive immune system, not the innate one. And of course, the trick here is that the thing's got to make a decision very quickly, otherwise you're dead. And correspondingly, in a brain, you've got to get all those axons and neurons and things connecting to each other very, very quickly indeed. There isn't time to go back to the genome and ask for their guidance. So within that system, once we see that in its sort of full potentiality, we are amazed. And so it is exceedingly complex. And I'm fascinated, you know, although this is way on the edge of my thing, but from where I'm talking, or no, people won't see this, lots and lots of books because I'm very old fashioned and I like reading and I like handwriting and that's the way I do my thinking. But the fact of the matter is that in a sense, almost all we have now is outside our brains. You know, it is there and we know, especially because of these extraordinary technological advances, that the research I have been doing would have been impossible 20 years ago because I simply couldn't have got a hold of all that literature. I would have worn the ladders out in the libraries to get up and down the various stacks. So that's hardly a sort of a proper response to what you're arguing for, but it is a warning perhaps or at least a, a suggestion rather than a warning that, and I don't want to get diverted on extraterrestrials, but perhaps if we were able to find them, we would be thinking of the completely the wrong thing. We'd be thinking of ourselves, you know, vaguely bipedal and all that sort of stuff. And no doubt in their evolution history, that was exactly the same case. But in point of fact, it may be, and people have argued this, and this is really too far off piece to worry too much about, that what, as you say, might lie in the future? Well, I've no better idea than you have in that area. So that, that's the nub of the argument. It's, it's not trying to suggest there's something deeply mysterious about complexity. It seems to be inherent in the system. But I mean, one of the best things you can do is to actually, I've never been to Santa Fe Institute, I'm afraid I probably wouldn't be allowed within 20 miles of it. But, you know, you sort of sit these people down after 20 gin and tonics and, you know, look them in the eye. Well, I try to and say, now, can you tell me what exactly is complexity? And with any luck, there'll be a sort of distant gargling sound, you know, and a sound of ice being crunched in the mouth and all the rest of it. I mean, we all know what it is, but define it, not so straightforward. Yeah, actually, there's a great document that I love sharing with people because this topic comes up a lot. And in fact, that was the aggressive question that one of my advisors put back to me when I first encountered this stuff. And I started thinking that they're as an undergraduate and started thinking that this discipline offers a lot of potential insight into some of the fundamental questions of evolutionary biology. And I said, I wanted to study it in grad school. And they, the guy just says, Explain to me what complexity is before you tell me that you are going to pursue this as a grad student. But then there's Seth Lloyd at MIT came up with a PDF that I'll link in the show notes where he offers 30 different ways to measure complexity. And so it's one of those things that to me, there's a poetry in the fact that much like the species concept itself rather than converging on one explanation, one theoretical framework to rule them all, that the longer these fields go on, the more that the concepts within them speciate in the same way that the organisms they're describing mm -hmm. seem to speciate. I mean, my response to that critic would be that we're actually in a better standing in terms of our understanding of this material because we have 30 different valid ways of looking at this rather than just one. And so you see a more resilient theory 
Anyway, so that's yeah. that's just an aside. But no, no, I think I came across that 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 article. In fact, I, well, I did write a chapter on complexity once bacteria now new york did i'm not sure it did me any good and certainly didn't do anybody else any good at all that's for certain but i enjoyed trying to get my mind around it's published quite a few years ago fortunately but that's a fair point i mean you 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 could without being excessively negative about this to say what you say is absolutely correct uh, and in a, in a way you've dissected it not to murder necessarily but you know try to tease it apart a bit a bit like a piece of shredded pork or lamb you know sort of a couple of forks working away at it and that of course reminds me of a horrible sense of philosophy where there are whole defined fields which are coherent themselves and yet have almost nothing to say to anybody else and i don't have any problem with that but i have colleagues who are philosophers and i I have to say i slightly will because you know they tend to belong to this school or that school so uh, a friend of mine introduced me quite recently to alfred north whitehead of all people which which I knew next to nothing, and I'm still pretty ignorant about it. But uh, when I mentioned his name to to some other people, there was sort of you know an audible silence and ah oh, yes yes process theory ah oh, yes 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 you know and so forth. And you know there's nothing wrong with this; it's all part of our thinking. But in the end, and perhaps it's a, delu- a delusion to think you know there's going to be some fabulous synthesis. And perhaps that's why Darwin is still such a grail. He, he never goes away. You know? And you could say, well, we just reinvent him, and I don't have any quarrel with that particularly. And indeed, you know, in terms of his ability to hint at things which turned into major discoveries, he's almost unrivaled. You know, I'm not, I'm not in any way trying to demean this particular story. But sometimes one gets to a stage where you sort of think, well, if we're going to have 30 different schools, and if you use the analogy with philosophy and you think of, you know, Wittgenstein and Heidegger, and I don't know much about these people, I'm afraid, that's all great fun. And I have no quarrel with that. But sometimes you might have to simply say, well, you know, this is a sheet of paper with these names on. I'm now going to scrumple it up in front of you and put it in the waste paper basket or trash can. Sorry. That's what I think. <laughs> yeah. So all good to talk to and talk about. I'm not in any way being negative about it. If my book, in a certain sort of sense, however inadequately, is trying to do anything, it's trying to say, can we just actually stop moving the mirrors around? Can we actually just throw open a window and try and look back in the room rather than spending our entire time looking at this sort of rather misty landscape? Well, that's interesting because then in bringing up Alfred North Whitehead, you know, one of the things that I talk about on the other show a lot is this paper that was led by David Krakauer, SFI president, and uh, on the information theory of individuality. And they, they apply, you know, Ilya Prigogine in talking about mm-hmm. dissipative structures, you know, gives these examples like a whirlpool or a tornado that are to most people's intuition, not living Mm -hmm. or not, they're not individuals. And yet they come up with this formal framework. They extend gratitude to whitehead and process philosophy, where they say that there's a kind of individuality exists on a kind of continuum Mm -hmm where on the one hand, the structure is scaffolded entirely by its environment. It has no inherited information. There's no genome for a tornado, and but it's based entirely on structural relationships with the physics of its surround. And then you move through like colonial organisms or mm. the bug bacterium associations that you're talking about, where there is some kind of, you know, we're like humans, you know, like nature and culture are in balance for us. And so we're not actually individuals in the way that we conventionally think of individuals, which would be something more like a rabbit or something. But like, you know, on either end of these, their point was that basically there is no true perfectly singular unto itself individual with no environmental scaffolding. And in a way, an equally kind of bold and, and radical claim can be made about the whirlpool. If in if you think about the way that an environment and its structure may not be coded genetically, but is nonetheless inherited moment to moment, there's something about the landscape persists due to the the physical relationships of rocks and, you know, the atmosphere and so on. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not actually trying to bait you into a conversation on intelligent design because it's radically implausible. But there is something about the way that that thinking poses that intelligence itself and life itself may not be like a binary thing where like suddenly we find a moment in the fossil record that they exist and they didn't before. Mm. 
But David Krakauer talks about, he's working on a formal theory of natural selection, where selection is an interpretation based on an observation of evolutionary novelty. And that interpretation is being made by the environment itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's a provocative framing where you get something like intelligent design back, but it's emergent. Mm -hmm. It's not imposed externally through some sort of transcendental agent. But so anyway, I don't know, that's, that's a huge long rant. But it's just funny that you brought up Whitehead, because in this sort of shifting of mirrors back and forth between seeing things as objects or seeing things as processes. Mm -hmm. And to me, it seems like there is a way to give people that recognize that something doesn't add up about this idea that life and intelligence just suddenly emerge out of nothing. There's a way to give them back a kind of fundamental intelligence mm. in the world, but in a way that would be deeply dissatisfying to them, but also addresses some of the, the, some of the more sticky and persistent questions that are left on both sides of that debate. Sure, um, sure. I don't know what your thoughts are on all of that, but I just... Well, very restricted, I'm afraid, because the friend I referred to very briefly, a chap called Gordon Miller, who spent a little bit of time in Cambridge, and not very very likely he'll be listening to this podcast. I don't mean that personally, of course, you know, it's just we're all busy boys. Right. But he, he's been very kind to me and, and, and saying a bit about this. And I should mention in parenthesis, if anybody else is interested in this area, I've just been reading a, one book he very kindly gave me, but it's in a philosopher called David Griffin. And if you want a, a sort of more accessible introduction to Whitehead, then Griffin's your man. Uh, and he's also got some other very heretical ideas, which I'm certainly not going to mention on, on, on this podcast. No, no, no. But collectively, uh, my intuition is, you know, as ever been an arrogant Cambridge scientist, I don't think any of this is actually going to work at all. I, th I think that the, the answer lies completely orthogonally to that. But I've been so often wrong in the past, so I'm very happy to go down that path yet again and be tripped up by something like Whitehead. But in essence, as you hint, uh, the, the, the question is, in the end, is, you know, agencies of creation, you know, uh, what, what I think be called either pantheism or panentheism, uh, which are not, I believe, quite the same things. And correspondingly, as I believe Whitehead argues, in the sense of that, you know, the, the naive philosophers would say, well, we, well, you know, Descartes, I suppose, something like that. We know we see the world, we, we understand the world because we can see it. Oh, and this turns out to be extremely unlikely. Of course, we sense things. But how we make sense of them is actually a completely different question. And again, I think there, at least as against the 30 philosophers we, we mentioned in passing, here we might actually narrow it down to two or three contenders. And deeper down, this is, you know, ranting on now, it's not impossible. In fact, they, well, they're all saying the same thing in a slightly different way. And this, this is way, way beyond my pay scale. So I, I better shut up straight away. But I take your point. You know, these are things which we can talk about outside science. To loop it back into science a little bit, and thanks for indulging me there on my these rants. But a moment ago, you brought up the brain and this notion, one of my favorite terms, again, to nod to Gould, in the entire field is exaptation. You call it co-option, you know, the way that adaptations recruit materials that are already lying around. And you made a comment about this process of simplification, moving in the genes and the way that they, they code anatomy from one-to-one -one function mappings to multifunction mappings. And so that's you know, how over time we find the words in our language come to mean more than one thing. And so mm. oh, we, you know, we could remember fewer words, but then each word has plurisignative, you know, to, to use a James Joyce kind of thing. Mm. So there's, I, there's an interesting link to this that I don't think I actually, well, I, I didn't make it through all of your footnotes or your God, notes not in this book. Two. Dear me. <laughs> it's quite a, it's like, this is, you know, I, I would go and see a doctor if you wanted if you to see if yeah. that starts, you know, you know, see someone, see a medical expert quickly. I just want to give you credit to say that this book has like 150 pages of endnotes and it's an enormously rich resource for people who want to do follow-up research. And, you know, to your point about these are not my ideas, you know, I'm synthesizing. I, I have to really give you credit as a synthesist, such diligent citations. Thank you. But yeah, so I didn't, I, I'm not sure if he was actually mentioned in this book, but Adi Livnot uh, in Israel talks about, there being a relationship between the like fire together, wire together of the forming of neural networks in the brain, and there being a kind of a similar thing going on at the g a genome where the genome simplifies through the mechanism of genes that are being expressed at the same time through an organism's behavior and interactions with its environment. Mm -hmm. 
ending up fusing together into one gene. And so I'm curious, you know, how you think about this. There's Lamarck, another 19th century evolutionary thinker, is typically dismissed because, oh, it's not what Darwin was talking about. But Livnot seems to be a bridge between what you're saying about processes of simplification in evolution and this notion of co-opting materials, repurposing them. And then also, you know, if we are zoomed out as far as we typically are, then it looks like all of these mutations are happening randomly. But Liv Knott's kind of arguing that a lot of mutation may actually be non-random because it's the various components of a genome, again, going kind of down this laziness slope mm. and pursuing simpler and simpler functions. And so, you know, it's one more point in this case where like, I remember 20 years ago, none of the biologists that I was talking to really gave much credit to epigenetics. Mm -hmm. And so, mm. you know, the, the notion that like all of this other information is heritable through molecules in association with the DNA. Um, I don't know. Again, I'm ram I'm ranting here and I'm going to I'm going to stop and punt it back over to you. But, you know, there's just something really profound here again in in the way that it seems like a lot of the stuff that you're talking about allows for a kind of why not both attitude towards mm -hmm. some of these these fundamental debates where you, you can see how, you know, maybe Lamarck had a piece of it right. If we flip things and we see them the way that you're seeing them about how novelty emerges and how efficiency operates in evolution, then yeah. Yeah, well, I'm not, I would say straight away, I'm really unfamiliar with this area completely. So I don't think I can say anything particularly coherent about it. I mean, you know, as you say, I be nervous about always using the word simple, even though, you know, I understand why it's attractive. And with regard to the little I know about the epigenetics and so forth, and indeed further back what Lamarck was trying to say rather than what he's always been told to have said, which is rather different. And presumably, I think it's fair to say Lamarck had this sense of a deeper organization to life. And of course, you know, at that stage in 19th century France, you know, how on earth could you articulate this when he knew rather little about the fossil record? And indeed, I think he largely came from his knowledge from plants, if I remember correctly. And, you know, and then, of course, you go back again, thanks to Gordon Miller again, to, to Goethe, actually, again, with this sort of, you know, organizational system whereby things which you know, are in their own way sort of profoundly straightforward have this almost endless multiplicity of endpoints, which, of course, paradoxically turn out to be convergent as well. So I'm not sure I, I can really add anything very helpful to that. It is, as you say, this intuition. And in a way, you can see why people who walk past a graveyard and there's a big heap of earth there, and at the end of it, it's got a little stone which says vitalism. And you can see why people sort of wish the earth didn't occasionally tremble. You know, they say, well, we've killed this, haven't we? And at one level, of course, we have, because there's nothing peculiarly identifiable about life, which in any way just separates it from its component parts, aka atoms. But on the other hand, you know, when you see any organism itself, this degree of integration, and indeed, you know, the fact that the environment makes the organism that makes the environment that makes the organism, and so on and so forth, these are all sort of, you know, platitudes, effectively. But what always astonishes me about embryology, or, you know, the general homeostasis, or the capacity to extract nutrients, like our friends the sap suckers and so forth, is dazzling, is absolutely extraordinary. And I don't have any, if you, I don't think it's an answer to that, other than to try and understand how is it that ultimately we end up, I mean, this is, you know, going way off into areas which are probably beyond what anybody would want to talk about at the moment. But how is it we end up with, you know, a, a communicating species, not just vocalizing and saying, you know, watch out, there's a snake or something, but actually interrogating the world. And I think this is part of the mystery. So it's, I'm not answering your question. Uh, the simple reason is that, you know, most of this is not an area I'm familiar with. So I'm not going to try and bluff my way through this at all. But I can understand intuitively what your colleague in Israel is saying and, and, and this idea that in the end, you know, that, that there is a fundamental identity between things. And of course, that promises to some people to be mathematically describable. But whether that actually gets us quite where we want to go is a different question, of course. So again, thanks for indulging me and also for your care and your rigor. It seems like maybe this is a good point to bump on to this question of, of mass extinctions again. And perhaps I can ask you to lead us across the bridge. For the, I mean, I imagine most of the people listening to this show are at least, you know, at a distance familiar with this concept of the Cambrian explosion and, you know, the fact that 
the you know the Burgess Shale in, in Canada, and then these other shales that you've mentioned in passing now in China and, and elsewhere, give us a snapshot into a window where it suddenly it seems like you have this enormous profusion of new forms and so on. So what I'm hoping is we can get through your comments on common misunderstandings about big bangs in biology, which we've been dancing around this whole time, and why we see moments where there's like a, a stepwise increase, right? But then also where we see what the relationship is between moments like that and moments of mass extinction, and why what it is about your story and your interpretation of mass extinctions that differs from the common apprehension. You know, this is setting us up, I hope, for some questions I have for you about the relationship, if there is one, between moments of explosive radiative diversification and and moments of collapse in Earth history. And so that's Yes, please. Okay. I'm going to like take the wheel. <laughs> Try to, because yeah, I've got to remember, of course, in America, you all drive automatics, you see. So I'm going to stick to my old stick model here. And we'll, we'll start in second and not go too fast at the moment. And then I get my eyesight checked at some point as well. So I, I think that the, that the, I, I wouldn't want to dwell so much on the big bangs of evolution. I, I mean, you know, certainly with regard to the Burgess Shale, things have moved on dramatically. I think to the first approximation, it's pretty clear that it was rapid, but not too rapid. I think it's increasingly clear that the sort of, if you like, the solution to the problem lies in the so-called ediacaran assemblages. And I had been doing some work in China, which I fear will now never come to fruition, at least in, 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 so far as I'm concerned, but which I thought was very intriguing with regard to a few of these sort of primitive groups like sponges and so forth. But that's another story. But may, maybe the way then to try and join the two together is to think specifically of the end Cretaceous mass extinctions, because this is, if you like, the, the canonical example. I mean, everything goes wrong, you know. First of all, you know, uh, the, the Dakar uh, volcanics in India are puffing away merrily, and it's an episode of mass volcanism. And there's lots of people going around with clipboards saying, oh, this doesn't look at all, at all good. And then the next thing they see, of course, is there's an enormous great hole in Mexico where an asteroid has just arrived. So nobody wants that. And that makes things worse. And there is an argument. I don't know whether it's still widely accepted that it was the sort of seismic propagation around the planet, which then focused on the town traps, which is basically on the antipodes to the Shishalab impact site. And it has been argued that that actually accentuated the eruptions. You know, it released large amounts of magma, which then came through and so on and so forth. So it's all it's bad news all around. And, and the dinosaurs go extinct, probably not over a weekend, but maybe in 100,000 years, who knows. And the, the crucial thing, which has been emphasized again and again and again, ad nauseam, and I think Dean Jay Gould was as, as a keen exponent on this, is sure enough, with the dinosaurs, there are little chaps there which look less interesting than guinea pigs or gerbils, about the size of a shrew. And there are our ancestors, they're mammals, hooray. And of course, once the dinosaurs step down and similar things happen in the ocean, this allows the mammals to diversify. And that's, I know, the fossil record shows that pretty clearly. You know, it is a major diversification and you can argue it's an ecological release and, and so on and so forth. However, I, I think it's fair to say, although it's perfectly well known, it's underemphasized, is in point of fact, the mammals themselves, first of all, originate, well, the, you have to go back to the Permian for, for the story to begin. And then you go to the Triassic. Thank you very much. Indeed. And it is indeed true that for the bulk of their Mesozoic history, they're not doing anything terribly distinguished. What they do do fascinatingly is actually converge on all sorts of subsequent mammals in things which approximate to a beaver or approximate to these gliding forms. And that's all very fascinating. But the take home message is, I think, that the major groups are already diversifying in the Cretaceous. The writing, in my, from my perspective, is already on the wall. And, of course, this is dependent on fragmentary material. It's undertaken by vertebrate paleontologists, of which I am emphatically not one. And, indeed, they, there might be some discussion as to which of the major groups of the mammals are already present in the late Cretaceous. But I think the majority of people would say there are at least, th at least three of these big groups are already there and waiting. And it's no big surprise, of course, that, if you remove the competitors, simplifying dramatically, then indeed the mammals will take over. But 
my thesis would be that in point of fact, in all a mass extinction, and this is really you know, going full circle back to Darwin and evolution, is that these organisms are already there ready to take over. And if they're given an opportunity of a mass extinction, and the same would apply to any of the other four great mass extinctions, the most dramatically, I think the end Permium event, well, there are actually two events, but much the same story applies there. So that's one aspect of it. And it's just to say that, well, thank you very much. That mass extinction was very, very useful because what it does so far as the mammals are concerned is it gives you effectively 50 million years free. Instead of having to do all the grunt work and heavy lifting and working slowly, slowly, slowly to replacement. So eventually, more socially adept, tall making, warm blooded creatures emerge, which decide that dinosaurs should either be put in zoos or end up in high end restaurants, I, something similar to ourselves. This thing's going to happen sooner or later, whether you like it or not. And so in the present day, of course, we have plenty of, of reptiles in, in, the, in the tropics, lizards, most obviously, and snakes and all the rest of it. But if you imagine a counterfactual world whereby the asteroid misses and the Dakar eruptions aren't as severe as, as they uh, turned out to be and so on and so forth, then what happens? Well, in the Oligocene, the world begins to refrigerate. And this is, you know, going into the ice ages we're presently in. And ice ages are nothing to do with evolution. So then you can say, well, what's going to happen in the temperate and the polar zones? Are, are the reptiles going to do really well there? No, no, not particularly. On the other hand, I would suggest this is an area where the mammals and the birds, which are agreeably convergent in many respects, would actually then take the initiative. And because simplifying dramatically, Birds and mammals have bigger brains than most reptiles. It's not that reptiles are stupid. It's not that some reptiles have quite complex social arrangements and so on and so forth. But by and large, they are more amenable to manipulation. As I mentioned, they're warm-blooded and maybe some dinosaurs were warm-blooded and so forth. So that's one aspect. Of it is that the mass extinctions are paradoxically creative. The other aspect about it, which again is perfectly well known, there's nothing sort of mysterious about this, but in point of fact, if you look at the Cretaceous world, in many, many respects, it's modern. If, if the rainforests have appeared, the androsperms, the flowering plants appear, well, certainly in the lower Cretaceous, arguably sometime before then, depending on what you think some of the pollen are, even back to the triad correspondingly if you go into a, a late cretaceous forest it's alive with the insects including butterflies and all those sorts of things and and social insects are doing very nicely indeed thank you yes ants in particular so of course through time it, really going back to the discussion about you know increasing complexity in inverted commas you know the biosphere itself is progressively through the jurassic becoming a more interesting place and in a sense, the, the anomaly are these enormous great reptiles, the ones in the sea. Well, what happens there is quite interesting, in fact, because the ichthyosaurs go extinct in these are the dolphin like reptiles. They go extinct, I think, in the middle Cretaceous. They don't, they're not victims of the mass extinction. And their place is largely taken by these marine lizards known as the mosasaurs, which is fascinating, quite closely related to the Komodo dragon. And blow me down, one of these groups of mosasaurs is actually busy re evolving into something like an ichthyosaur. And that doesn't matter too much because the mosasaurs get it in the neck as well. There's a few stories there which could be unpacked about. Yeah, well, never mind. But it doesn't really make any difference because, you know, in due course, in Eocene in particular, there's another bunch of dog-like creatures who sort of stand on the water edge and say, you know, right, drop your legs, grow a flipper, get your teeth bigger. I'm going to become a whale. And, you know, to the very first approximation, you've got these ocean-growing creatures. But this time, of course, they're mammals. And, and so the story goes on. So it, it, it is fundamentally, and I hope provocatively, that mass extinctions are – Fascinating to teach because you have to draw on so many lines of evidence. But although they are depicted almost invariably as a, as a dry run for Armageddon, and indeed on the day themselves, they are most distressing. In the grand scheme of things, they actually give a biosphere something like 250 million years for free because they shave off this sort of long, long time it takes to displace a incumbent group by the new group. And it is painstakingly slow. So thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So this is great because you've led us directly where I wanted to ask you. You talk about the end Cretaceous extinction and you know mammals being poised to take advantage of that. And one of the features that you describe here, you just mentioned brain size being one of them, but you also mention in this chapter that they have a whole toolkit now 
of diverse teeth, you know, like that being one of the defining characteristics of mammals. And of course, there are a couple dinosaurs that started mm. down this yep. path, started having kind of more specialized teeth. But, you know, and so we're not, again, as you've already said here, we're not pointing to kind of one defining trait, but a, a whole suite of traits that allow them to take advantage of a bad situation. And, you know, again, this is something that comes up on on a complexity podcast a lot way back in, in 2020, when David Krakauer and I had a conversation comparing mass extinctions to market crashes, and yeah. how, you know, that there's something about something that defines both of these, these collapse moments, these interregna in the history of a system is that the, it seems as though the beings that thrive across these, these get these punctuations are generalists or rather than being very, very narrowly specialized and utterly dependent on one node in mm -hmm. an ecological network that, you know, they're standing on one bridge that falls out from under them, that they've got a portfolio of possible traits or functions or resources that they can depend on. And this is something that in your conversation about the end Permian extinction, you're talking about how, you know, brachiopods, which for people that are not literate in the fossil record, they look a lot like modern bivalves, like clams and oysters and so on, but they're a different animal entirely. And, you know, you talk about how brachiopods do one thing very well, anchor themselves to the seafloor and suck in seawater. But bivalves do a host of other things as well, including sw swimming and gliding for short distances. And some of them are carnivorous. So again, it seems like part of the picture that you're painting here is that it's actually through the preparatory diversification of these lineages before a major disruption, whether it's the diversity of the teeth and the jaw of a primitive mammal or the diversification of reproductive strategies across different kinds of mammals. You know, it's the fact that so many of them are smaller and therefore less exquisitely sensitive to disruptions in the availability of caloric resources, the different kinds of bivalves and how they you know, the different strategies mm. basically creates what in investing you think of as like a high beta portfolio, where you've got a lot of money down on these high risk startups that may or may not go anywhere. But then if the market gets whacked by a meteor, then those are the those are the people that tend to do best are the ones that are that are less sort of dependent on a particular outcome. What I'm getting around to here is this question about what it is that you you feel really is the relationship between the you know like generalists or diversity of these ultimately successful lineages broadly and the fact that they manage to make it through and thrive through these disruptions. I'm curious your thoughts on on all of that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> you, when, you, when you when you turn the microphone off, you can say, that's, I think that's the most disappointing interview I've ever done in my life. You know, I'm not going to dodge the question again. It's more, it, 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 it's, um, well, a certain degree of uncertainty when it comes into biology about generalists and specialists. I mean, I, I appreciate, you know, in the good old days, it was called R and K, and not, or I may be still is, I don't know. And the, the the thing will be, I think, that you know, in in the sort of you know the plur pluripotency of of the biosphere, you're always going to end up with specialists. There's always somebody who's going to fund some niche market. You know, I don't know, maybe by sort of grinding up some beans, which originally came from Arabia and put in a, in a, in a paper cup and selling it to people on street corners. And I came back with a coffee bar, heaven help us. You know, well, that's actually very comic at the moment because Cambridge is, I don't know how it is in your part of the world, but Cambridge, I think I've done the extrapolation. It'll turn out a bit like Darwin and his elephants. And in fact, about 40 years time, there'll be nothing in Cambridge except coffee bars, but we'll, we'll keep an eye on the curve <laughs> just if in trends case. Continue, yeah. Oh, heaven help me. But I mean, with regard to the mollusks versus the brachiopods, and this actually goes back to another one of Gould's famous papers he wrote with a guy called Brad Calloway, 
about so the ships which pass in the, in the night. Do they actually care about each other? And, and that does, in a certain way, sort of go back to some aspects about the organisation of the biosphere. Because if they're all free players, you know, and as long as they promise not to step on each other, then they're really not too bothered what the person beside them is doing. But th I, I think the point with the mollusks is not only they are ecologically much more diverse, but also, with one exception, every sort of ecological strategy in the Permian goes through unchanged into the Triassic. And they might have had a hard hit of it and you know it might have been nothing but smoking carcasses everywhere but the mollusks themselves were already busy taking over the paleozoic world long long even before the permian and, and and the like and i can well imagine you know in an intuitive sort of sense that if there are people which are able to feed on almost anything then in a mass extinction they're going to be in an advantage and indeed i believe that's the argument which is still used as to why the freshwater ecosystems seem to have almost no hit at all you know they come through pretty well unscathed and this is not entirely obvious why it might be the case because you know they, you know they're, they're still subject to environmental stress as anybody knows who's or a lake or a river near them, but be that as it may. But I, I, I wouldn't be so concerned about that. And also, uh, I do remember years ago, I think Niles Eldridge and people like that were trying to find these connections between economic theory and, and heaven help us, you know, that takes, if you're not too careful, to a, to a, to a, a clever bearded man in, in, in Victorian London called Karl Marx. So we're not going down that route either. Thank you very much indeed. And trying to see how, if you like, the economics even in a human sense, scale to what we see in biology. And again, I, I'm a little bit like the philosophers. I know enough economists to realize that they've got a whole set of different versions, which explains why, of course, in the West, our economists are such a runaway success at the moment. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, apparently not. Oh, no. <laughs> so to speak, so to speak. Well, the, <laughs> but, well yeah, the economists are, by and large, and SFI smack talks this all the time, but still looking at economics as though it were a system seeking equilibrium. Exactly. Rather than well. Fundamentally out of equilibrium. And, and Absolutely. And, and run by yeah, run by humans for humans, which I thoroughly approve of, by the way, as long as, long as they don't uh, destroy people's economy. I better not get into that. Too much. So, so with respect to how things go through, through mass extinctions, I, I will as ever dodge your question, but I think I can make two possibly related observations. One is that by and large, the recovery times from the environmental insult, which primarily seem to be volcanic and only occasionally due to an asteroid impact or something similar to that, are much faster than people thought. And as often as not, in fact, there was a paper I came across, I think it's in PANS some couple of months ago, where effectively, I mean, this was, you know, not quite instantly, but immediately above the impact thing. It's a fish fauna, I think. And everybody's doing fine. Thank you very much indeed. And again, in a certain way, what do you expect? Because, you know, if you're in Shishlub and you're an Ammonite, then you know, it's that's it. It's curtains, okay. But at least in the Permian, and I think to some extent in the Cretaceous, there are actually refugia. There are areas which effectively just don't see these mass extinctions. And this is hardly rocket science because, you know, the world is a diverse place. And, for example, if you talk about climate change, well, we better be slightly careful what I say, but there isn't a universal story there. And we've had very hot summers this, this summer in Europe, you know, toasty water. Not out, not beyond all records, but still very warm indeed. But of course, what is sometimes forgotten is that there are other parts of the world not so far away which are unseasonally cold. And this is not to say that you want an unseasonally cold or an unseasonably warm thing, but to remind ourselves that the planet as a whole is a mosaic. And what will count as an environmental insult close to the action versus somewhere which is remote may mean that even if people are having a really bad time across 80% of the Earth's surface. There'll be 20% of the Earth, which is actually not too, not too bad at all. And we certainly see that in the Permian. If you go to the stratigraphic sequences in northern Canada in particular, sort of Vancouver and further area there, it's you're fairly hard pushed to see much severe happening. Okay, so I feel like I the question I asked you a moment ago was just unbelievably Baroque. So let's let's follow the trend line you called for evolutionary systems and simplify this somewhat and see if it does better. Page 88, you ask about the mammals. Paradoxically, was their small size actually an escape clause and their ultimate key to future success? And I just noticed that 
your footnote here cites a paper by Jose Bonaparte, who I got to give a shout out to as the discoverer of my favorite dinosaur, Carnotaurus. <laughs> but, but yeah, this is, I mean, so this is to your point about mosaicism and refugia and how animals are able to take advantage of a heterogeneous landscape through a disruption. You know, this seems to be where, and I'm curious, am I getting this right is basically the question that this is part of the relationship between, you know, when I, when I studied under Robert Bacher as a teenager, and he made the point that, you know, you look through the, you know, the end Cretaceous extinction. And he always used to say like most of what survived was like under five kilograms, you know, like that it, it mass extinctions tend to carve off the top of the tiramisu mm. as it were. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, even though you, you kind of already said you're dodging the, the question, what is it about size here that you think matters in terms of understanding the characteristics of an organism passed through, or what is the relationship between between size and and the heterogeneity that seems? Because you know, elsewhere you've said in this, you're talking about how there's a different kind of mosaicism where advanced features sit cheek by jowl, sometimes literally with more primitive ones. And so you have a mosaicism even within organisms, and then a mosaicism in the landscape. And do, I mean, is that how much do you think those things are related in terms of the way that like recombination seems to fit cool. into this story? Yeah. Well, I mean, with regard to, I'd have to actually refresh my memory of the footnote on on the the Bonaparte paper, but uh, but we we, about we, we miniaturization. We, yeah, no, that's right. Now I remember I remember reading the paper, and I, I unfortunately I, I dare not tell you how I do my research, but it would be, be it's gratifyingly <laughs> archaic. It uses file cards, and I could dig out the cards, and it will have about three hundred words written in minute script, and I could refresh my memory immediately. But w with regard to to small size versus large size, I mean the standard argument. I I don't know if this still applies is of course that population sizes tend to of large animals tend to be the, the, the proportionally less for, for fairly self-evident reasons and therefore for that as a result they tend to be they tend to be more vulnerable uh, and again I, I i wouldn't be too concerned about that if if there was if you like a phylogenetic uniqueness whereby certain animals could never get to a certain size and therefore were forever forbidden from entering some new realm of possibilities. But that simply is not the case. And in point of fact, I think even Gould might have pointed this out and certainly other people have, have, have reminded us many times, big animals, which by the way, include ourselves, are actually extremely rare for pretty good reasons because, you know, metabolically, we're, we're expensive enough to run as it is at the best of times. And, and overall, you know, most things, you know, uh, amongst the mammals, they're, they're all, you know, not much bigger than a fox or a dog and a lot of great deal smaller than that as we know amongst the rodents in particular so with respect to you know what allows the mammals to sneak through at one point rather than another is that prior to that some were pretty hefty size but certainly i think for much of the jurassic it is fair to say that the people in charge were the reptiles and they were not all of them by any means in fact because fortunately some of them became very very small indeed about the size of a chicken and decided those uh, those forelimbs could be employed for something more useful like flying so off they go that's of course what the theropod dinosaurs do when they turn themselves into birds so you know, there's a whole set of possibilities there by the i think the mid cretaceous there's a docodont which is a relatively primitive group of mammals, as I understand. And this is the famous one, which has got baby dinosaurs in its gut. So you know, it's not it's not a one-way traffic, but this docodon is about the size of a dog. So, you know, it, it's a big animal. And again, this gives me some confidence that sooner or later the mammal is going to pull through uh, and indeed take over the world because of the aforementioned social capacities and brain size and warm-bloodedness and all the rest of it. The, the, the thing is about mosaicism, again, the thing I was harping on about was not so much the environmental mosaic. I, I, I can well imagine. Again, one of one of our failings is because I don't know if you've got you've, you mentioned you're teaching your 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 daughter about dragons, and that's quite right too. So you should. I mean, C.S. Lewis, as you may remember, wrote somewhere you know that there's, uh, was it Eustace was weak on dragons. We soon found out about that. But keep keep up the good work there. It is is now I've entirely lost the thread of what I was going with the mosaicism. Is that when we look at any group as it evolves. There is indeed, I think, invariably, not not sometimes. I think invariably, this mixture of 
relatively primitive characteristics as defined in terms of the phylogenetic tree versus advanced ones. And I probably take us too far afield and probably in fact i should drop my voice because sometimes people you know they, if they're children if, if anybody's got children listening at the moment they may not want to hear this okay because professor conway morris is going to mention a word called cladistics oh god you know rush the children out of the no don't don't worry about it darling you don't need to know about that you're at least 25 or something this is something which sends the cladists these are the people who use this method of cladistic analysis of, of derived versus primitive versus shared characters and all the rest of it. We won't unpack that. Please, please don't. This sends them around the bend because, of course, the thing is on the broad assumption that everybody's more or less evolving, you know, continuously and in the sort of same direction. So they get more advanced. So they all have advanced characters. And there's an extremely comic example or to do with one of the areas I address in, 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 in the book with regard to the transition between the fish in the Devonian, the so-called Sarcopterygians, the relatives of the of the lungfish and the coelacanth, and their descendant tetrapod forms. And they have classic forms like Tecatalic, Tecatalic, got it more or less right, the Nopteran uh, and the Canthostega and all these wonderful creatures here. But in any case, what happens is they find some new material. Well, I think it's probably a new species from the Devonian. And they've got this cladogram. This is the thing which they've carefully constructed over many years. And they've got a fairly robust cladogram. It's looking all right. It's got certain is here, there, and everywhere. And they, in any case, they parachute in this new species and add all the characters there, and the whole thing collapses. You know, it's, it, it's like a, it's like a failed souffle. You know, you get it out of the oven, and it's this horrible smoking mess at the bottom of the dish. You know, it's just fallen apart. But why I think mosaicism is interesting is at least two reasons. One is, of course, going back to the question of you know what makes life life. It's this sort of versatility, this ability to integrate bits and pieces in not a jigsaw-like way. I mean, you know, to use the metaphor of a jigsaw, it'd be like having 12 different jigsaws, one of Canterbury Cathedral, one of the Empire State Building, tossing them all up in the air and then expecting to get a building out of it. I and, mean, you know, no. Or even better, you know, a jigsaw of a fish or something. But the other aspect, to my way of thinking, again, of course, this is the way evolution's working, thank you very much indeed, and it allows them to, to experiment. So unsurprisingly... You have literally thousands of different combinations, and you see this very clearly in the sarcopterygian tetrapod transition. You see it as clearly in the theropod to bird transition. In each, and I think every case there, what one actually finds is that ultimately the chaps who come through at the end, and we call an amphibian or, or, or a blackbird, are, from Gould's perspective, just a unique endpoint of an unpredictable process. And if you just took that particular lineage with all its twists and turns, you could persuade yourself it is a highly contingent set of circumstances. But if you look at the larger picture, as is pointed out with the, with the, with the, with the, the invasion of the air by the theropods, and there's some evidence to suggest that this could have happened independently perhaps as many as eight times. Now, not all of those, of course, are uh, active flight. Some of them are gliders and all the rest of it. Yeah. But there, so there we are. So that's the mosaicism is something which I think, again, uh, with respect, every, so yes, yes, I know about that. You know, you don't even you don't even offer somebody another bit more tonic in their gin. You know, don't, don't, don't waste my time. You know, it's quite right. Yeah. But actually, I think it's it's strange and neglected. It's sort of it's it's a it's a slight ghost of the banquet. Am I exaggerating? <laughs> well, okay. So I'm curious whether you think I've dog legged here with my next question, or whether this nestles directly into the points that you're making here. But I, you know, I was surprised. You you bring up this term, which I love. This is a, a, a fabulous handle I'd never heard before. That you know, I think about you know these questions a lot. And you bring up this term crisis taxon in here. There's a kind of animal or uh, organism that that thrives very well through these these collapses and you know i'm used to thinking about uh, at the end of the permian thinking about this organism kind of a squat pig-like thing called lystrosaurus mm, that's the one. and i just i just wrote a piece recently where i was citing lystrosaurus as this enormous you know as like the kind of thing that one should aspire to be you know that, that it's like a it's a it's a it's a garbage disposal. It'll eat anything, you know, mm. it's very squat, low to the ground, relatively small burrows, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's, it's kind of like if you, 
it you know if you were to design something to make it through a a complete bloodbath you know bet on Lystrosaurus but you say again in pointing to the footnote like let's not be so quick about this and you mention oh the disaster taxon you mentioned a paper by Sean Modesto the disaster taxon Lystrosaurus a paleontological myth mm. and so I, I had to pump the brakes and ask you really kind of pointedly about this one particular creature having not read the paper that you're citing here what am I getting wrong about Lystrosaurus and why is that actually not such a spectacular example when I'm exploring these kinds of questions with people? Well, I, I'd have to literally dig out my notes again on this. I mean, I, I, as we were discussing much earlier, of course, the problem is that you, you rely entirely on the sort of, you know, the external world to, re to remind you of what's going on. And, and I certainly, without getting out of Modesto's, you know, I've got the file card there, and I certainly remember reading the paper. But, but I, I think, that, I mean, more generally with regard to disaster tax, sir, uh, and I don't think I'm going to completely deflect your question. I'll do. I'll make a fairly good go at it. But even so, you can draw me back in in a moment. It is first of all, there's this whole set of I might almost say emotive terms. So we have disaster taxa. We have so-called Lazarus taxa. We have Elvis taxa. The Lazarus taxa, as you might imagine, are those which, quote, come back from the dead. And Elvis taxa are, are, are things which, in closer analysis, are complete fakes. They're not. The, they're not. The, King himself, they're, they're close, close resemblances, and this is convergent evolution, and the like. And the the thing about I'm not I say I must look at Modesto's paper again. And I'm not going to interrupt the interview, so I go and find it. I could find it in about thirty seconds. But the, the the point about this is that first of all, as I understand it, with regard to the vertebrate record across the Permo Triassic boundary spanning the Permian mass extinction, there are effectively only three parts of the world with a fairly good fossil record. And it is indeed the case that if you go to South Africa, then, you know, you spend your entire time digging up bits of Lystrosaurus. You know, oh, God, another one. You know, is, there, is there nothing else here at all? And one can say that in that particular part of the world, yes, as you say, it, it, it's a dismal existence, spends its entire time chewing these sort of totally indigestible lycopods. It's got uh, the, the picture I use in my talks has got this sort of ominous gray sky behind it. And they're looking fantastically gloomy. And as you also say, when things get really too, too bad, too torrid for words, and they go and burrow, you know, the whole thing's thoroughly miserable. But what's happening in the other parts of the world? You know, and one can easily see how in one particular environment, there will be a short lived opportunity for a particular group to flourish. And that's not surprising because things are bad. Nobody's disputing this for a moment. And as an example of sort of, if you like, trying to pinpoint the nature of the environmental crisis, what exactly is it? Because rather oddly, to the best of my reading, everybody agrees that mass volcanism is very bad indeed. And most people link it to, you know, release of various volatiles in, into the atmosphere. So that the whole place becomes a pretty poisonous place. And there may well be dramatic climate change linked to this. It's very, very possible. Sulfur dioxide, bad news, global cooling, all these sorts of things, or indeed extreme global warming, which may well account some of the other extinctions later on in the Triassic. That's all, you know, all perfectly fair. But as ever, what one's trying to do is say, well, first of all, can we stop using these emotive terms? They're great for teaching. A student will almost certainly remember disaster taxon or Lazarus taxon. So as you say, it's a good handle and gives you some sort of sense. But what exactly is this telling us about the grand scheme of things? And with great respect, not a great deal. I mean, there's nothing wrong with this. You know, it's a thing. I mean, the Lazarus tax, actually, I like slightly more. I mean, sometimes you have to lean forward and say, can you bring the children back into the room now? He's not going to talk about cladistics anymore. And in case of, you know, there's any residual uncertainty, this goes back, of course, to the account in St. John's Gospel, whereby Lazarus is dead. Great friend of Jesus goes to the tomb and says, you know, everybody says, well, don't be stupid. You know, the body will be stinking to high heaven. He says, no, no, uh, we're going to sort this out. And he does. You, you can or cannot accept the historicity of this particular account. We don't need to get diverted into that. But the point about the Lazarus tax, sir, is indeed that they go on holiday during the mass extinction. Nobody can find them. They've left no forwarding card and so forth, no telephone number, nothing like that. And then about 100,000 years later, half a million years later, there they are back smiling and saying, well, you know, looking slightly sheepish and saying, well, you know, we'll go, well, no, sorry about this old point. But this actually tells me nothing at all other than the fossil record is terrible. And it doesn't matter because in the grand scheme of things, we don't have to have every species which ever existed. And if we did, you know, we wouldn't have time to think. But we have a sufficiently 
accurate representation to understand at a fairly coarse level what is happening in the general trends of evolution. So if indeed it turns out, as is I think very likely the case, that the extinction percentages were probably nothing as severe as they're usually made out to be, for the very simple reason that, you know, most fossils and most species do not fossilize, either because they're soft-bodied or more particularly because they're relatively rare. So that's all, you know, again, I don't have any you know special quarrel about this, but it's again, the Conway Morris view is just, you know, can we step back a bit? You know, can we, can we look at this from not necessarily a better angle, but at least something which is, is slightly orthogonal to some of the areas of received thinking? So to that point, actually, there's a postdoc at SFI, Jack Oliver Shaw, a, f- a fellow Brit, who has been studying under Jennifer Dunn on the paleontological history of food webs. And I don't remember the name of his paper, but I'll find it and link to it in the show notes. He's been doing kind of inferential reconstructions of food webs. He's making exactly the point that you're making here, which is that a lot of what we have thought about the contingency of trophic networks and evolutionary history is based on very incomplete fossil records. And that Mm -hmm. actually Jen Dunn's work actually showed how the structure of these feeding networks all the way back to the Cambrian, through the Mesozoic, into the modern ocean. The organisms themselves are very different Mm. from place to place, but the structure of the metabolic relationships between them is, is very well conserved. And so, Jack Shaw has been looking at how we can infer from food webs, much as you talk about in this book, inferring from biomolecular data that like we can actually look and say, look, Mm -hmm. we're missing fossils right here because we know that something like this creature had to be feeding on something like this creature, but we can't find it because it's not Mm -hmm. leaving. It's, it's soft bodied or it's just, it died somewhere where we haven't dug. And so, yeah, I just thought that Mm -hmm. what you're pointing to and what they're pointing to is for somebody who's spent a life creating a crick in my neck, like looking (laughs) down on the ground for little bits of stuff fascinating because it tickles the like conspiracy theory gland for me where you can say like look where the lines converge Mm. on the horizon of our understanding Mm. and you Mm. can say there must be something there that you're getting all of these new techniques that weren't there when i was doing field work as a teenager where the biomolecular stuff and the the trophic network stuff all seem to be really reinforcing your argument here so I no, th- thank you very much. And I'll misremember it. I'm, I'm afraid because the, there's, there is, this is sorry. This is a bit like I, I think in, in your country you have these things called, called commercial breaks on the TV. Is that correct, Jim? You know, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, trouble is I, yeah. I, I don't have a television. You see, so I have to. So it's always help, I hope to come to your country. Actually, in about a month's time, I'm going to have to do a lot of catching up. You know, but uh, there's a science fiction story, and I f- apologise for not remembering the the author. I'm sorry about. I think it's American Elfenheim. I think it's called. And, it, and it, 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 what it is is a chap who's sort of mapping out medieval villages in, I think, Germany or somewhere in that part of Europe, and he's also thinking about the economy of how the villages are interconnected and the transport routes. And again, I'm doing a grave disservice to to what's a very very clever book and very enjoyable to read and there's a village in one place which should be there but it isn't and he says what on earth is going on so they start to dig around and 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 to 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 use what i believe is called technically a spoiler what it turns out is in fact this is actually related to a visit by an alien civilization and uh, (laughs) it's very clever and it's got this fantastically moving bit towards the end where in fact the aliens can't survive i think if i remember correctly there was a crucial nutrient which simply wasn't available and they 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 crash landed there but they have this this, from my perspective i'm not trying to get the conversation into aliens by the way far from it they've got this incredibly moving description of when they eventually sort of get into the forest and they find a deserted graveyard and there amongst the graves are the aliens there you know it's, it's it's very heartbreaking in fact but the thing there again is you say is that there's a logic to the organization of these things whereby as with the food web 
and perhaps with Elfenheim, the, the story itself. These things are interconnected in such a way that you can predict, which after all is what we are meant to be good at, what should be the missing components of these sorts of things. And of course, this applies across 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 the world, you know, in, in everything way you look. So I don't know the paper about the food webs, I'm afraid. I, I did many years ago construct a very elementary food web for the Burgess Shale, a completely primitive and amateur, and Doug Irwin and Rachel Wooden people have, have done much, much more sophisticated work in that particular area. But yeah, in essence, that, that stage... John's paper I, was with Doug Irwin, yeah. Oh, there we are. Okay, very good. That's the one, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, very great. Yeah, that's right. Actually, I'm, oh, I might have even seen it then it, it, out of the corner of my eye. But, but the result, that, uh, my very early thing was that I couldn't actually find any top predators. And of course, uh, we were at such a preliminary stage where I think I still thought Anomala Caris was a jellyfish or something. And, you know, the whole story has blossomed. And we now realize, apart from anything else, especially from the Chinese material, the, just the ecological diversity of these forms. Again, it's, it's not rocket science. We should have expected it from the beginning. But, you know, it's just so gratifying to see this huge range of different creatures, even amongst, you know, the anomalous carrot like forms, doing all sorts of different ecologies, which is what they should be doing. They've been reading Darwin. Well done. <laughs> okay, so there's one more question I really want to make sure I get to, and then I don't want to keep you too long. No, really. I've got to, I've I've got to be away, not immediately, but it's six o'clock here, which is absolutely fine. But I don't, no, no, please go on. We've got a bit of time, sure. Yeah. Okay. So this is a question that I've I've posed to a couple of different paleontologists, and I've never really gotten a satisfying answer, or no one no one has bit on this. And given everything we've talked about today, you're the perfect person to ask whether or not you feel like you have an answer. Because I've never seen anyone address this anywhere ever. And it is, you know, most people think about mass extinctions in terms of, like you've already said, volcanic eruptions, meteor impacts, you know, these kinds of exogenous mm -hmm. disruptions. But we also know, again, to draw a, an analogy to market dynamics that may make some people uncomfortable or may be seen as a stretch, that market crashes often happen due to endogenous, due to the mm -hmm. internal dynamics of the market itself, that you know people end up in what I've heard Dwayne Farmer call herd following behavior. And so everyone's trades become too correlated with each other. And so the whole system becomes brittle and it falls, it falls over on itself. There are the five classically recognized mass extinctions, but then there's something like 13 others that are maybe a third or half the amplitude of this. And one of them that I find really interesting is the minor mass extinction, if you can call it that, at the end of the Jurassic period, where there's a, a kind of a regime change in terrestrial ecology. Mm -hmm. And you point out this chapter on mass extinctions in a section on the road to tulips, you're talking about the origin of flowering plants. And how you mentioned here that actually, to a point you've made earlier in this conversation, the fossil record of flowering plants actually goes way back, possibly into the Triassic, you know, way before they're kind of classically recognized as appearing mm. on the surface. And that what we're actually looking at at the end of the Jurassic, at the beginning of the Cretaceous, is the moment that they really kind of take over and mm. not the moment where they first arise. It's sort of to your point about the Cambrian and the Ediacaran faunas that, you know, this stuff has a gritty prequel going far, far back that we're only starting to understand. But my question for you has to do with, I look at this and my intuition that I want to test here is that what happened at the end of the Jurassic is that the success, perhaps the success of flowering plants and specifically, to call to one of my mentors, Richard Doyle, wrote this book, Darwin's <laughs> Pharmacy, Sex Plants and the Evolution of the Noosphere, where he talks about, he's kind of building on Darwin's Descent of Man and, and about the role of sexual selection to being a kind of a specific case for how the the sort of utilization of attention by one organism of another for like the way a flower harvests the attention of pollinators with folds mm -hmm. and fancy colors to recruit it into helping that plant reproduce that Doyle is making this case for the importance of perception and some kind of whether you want to call it mind in the way that you're saying animals don't have mind in this chapter, but the aware of perception and of cognition and of attention 
in the formation of symbiotic relationships and how, you know, that this is what allows that, you know, that, that, by recruiting pollinators, you get this explosion of really, really specific symbiotic relationships between, you know, the, the one kind of moth that pollinates mm. this one plant, this kind of thing. And that kind of phenomenon leads to, like we were talking about earlier, you know, you end up with this enormous heterogeneity of recombinant strategies. You know, this one little thing can be associated to this thing now. And it seems to me like this may start to explain why there was such a pronounced shift from sort of like the age of Stegosaurus to the age of the Cretaceous mm. dinosaurs that like, especially because there's, I, I can't remember who did this work, but there was some suggestion that, I mean, around the same time, you know, like in the Cretaceous, you start seeing psychoactive fungi, like ergot species mm -hmm. living on flowering plants. And somebody made an argument that, you know, it may be that certain of the dinosaurs that didn't make it across the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary were not capable of digesting mm -hmm. some of the the flowering plants or the, the fungi that were associated with them and that ba they basically got poisoned out. And so my question to you has to do with the way that I feel like I'm kind of asking if we can even strengthen your argument about the way that mass extinctions hasten the proliferation of previously the, these species that are starting to become more and more diverse or lineages that are becoming more diverse and, and sort of, you know, to think about it in, in terms of like robustness, that there's like a cryptic mm. variety that is, you know, hiding behind what looks like a stable ecosystem. And then it comes to the fore in some kind of moment of disruption. Mm -hmm. But the question is, in what ways can we think about that cryptic variety, that diversity of these, these primitive mammals before and Cretaceous or whatever, as contributing to, in, not in all cases, right? Like we know meteors and volcanoes and so on was responsible for the end of the age of dinosaurs. But like, was it possible and how would we test the hypothesis that the cryptic variety of flowering plants and pollinators actually drove the massive regime change we see at the end of the Jurassic? And I ask this because we're living right now through this, <laughs> you're not super fond of like the you know Big Bang language, but we're living through this proliferation of technological quote unquote species right now. And, you know, to me, the way that cell phones, for instance, or like the internet infrastructure relates to us as individuals, again, to call back to Caleb Scharf, who, you know, who says that basically our human lives are now dominated by this compulsion to feed what he calls the data ohm. You know, that everything we do is writing books and recording podcasts and publishing science papers and, you know, producing television shows. And basically, we're a complete service as pollinators to this information and infrastructure through these relationships with data processing and communications devices. And so to me, it seems like there's this really natural analogy here between the plant pollinator thing and the human computer thing. And yet we're living in the so-called Anthropocene where, or a technosphere where this rampant proliferation of kinds of technology that seems to be driving people are, are now colloquially calling the sixth mass extinction mm. and that it's not an external thing, right? It's an internal thing. You know, humans are not some sort of weird extraterrestrial species that's landed on earth and are like harvesting it for nutrients or whatever. But there's a, a syntax that's emerging here and the success of these new kind of syntactical relationships is driving the collapse of a previous order. Mm. And so I'm, I don't know. I just like, this is just the one idea that I wanted to bring to you because it's really seems like if I try to connect the dots of everything that you've said in these two chapters of this book and the points about all of this, that, what's lurking underneath that is that it's not simply that mass extinctions are accelerating the sort of preloaded success of certain things, mm -hmm. but that it is in some cases anyway, the success of those diversifying forms that's driving the mass extinction, that it really is a coup on the mm -hmm. part of flowers or on the part of computers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I well, 
I, I'm. We all we all work. And be held to your answer. No, <laughs> no, no. We're, well, I shall reply in four words. Uh, no, we're, we're we're all in favour of analogies, and and and, and uh, they're always imperfect. I, I I mean, it's a very very intriguing idea, idea uh, and I haven't thought about it in that context directly uh, whatsoever. So that's good for the conversation, and undoubtedly. I think with the angiosperms, there really is a phase change in terms of plant complexity and its interrelations, especially with the insects. <clears throat> that's that's all correct. On the other hand, one's got to remind oneself that pollination per se is by no means restricted to the uh, to the flowering plants. So the, the, there are plenty of cycads and so forth. There's lots of fossil record going much further back. So it's not a new trick on the thing. And undoubtedly, flowers, as you know, Darwin himself famously realised, are, are something which are very, very peculiar. Yes, you can see they're precursors in some gymnosperms, and, and the Nitales in particular show this in a convergent way, which is quite fun. But I, I, I think you it would be very strange if the biosphere did not inadvertently, if you like, stress the world. And I, there's an argument, which I think I prefer very briefly in the book with regard to the nutrients, which by and large the angiosperms release. Because, by and, you know, if you're in a coniferous forest, it's pretty dull. I'm sorry, I know people who work on conifers, I apologize. You know, my, you can write <laughs> to me. Oh, no, never mind. But, you know, and there's, you know, there's usually this thick leaf layer of needles and, and everything's a bit grim. But once you go into the sort of humus rich angiosperm stuff, then, you know, there's this, you know, set of feedbacks. And I think Mike Benton may have argued in this direction as well with regard to sort of the interconnections between nutrient runoff, which, of course, we now know about from agricultural practices in terms of its effect on the oceans. And you may well be right that there were some dinosaurs which couldn't adapt to various fungal symbionts in, in the flowering plants. But on the other hand, I mean, so my uh, mycorrhizal associations go much, much further. So plant, plants and fungi have been in, in, in cahoots forever, basically. So, and, and this is not in any way trying to sort of knock your argument off off its perch, and and it, I don't dispute that there are these real sea changes when the world becomes more complex, and I can imagine that there are various groups or various taxa which do not find this ad. Advantageous, but that to me seems to be just part of the big Darwinian story, you know. That, and from that perspective, we you know we we can't be sure who would flourish in this new environment, who wouldn't. The only thing we can be absolutely sure about is that some will, and almost certainly more will. And yes, it, it's a fascinating possibility that the the end Jurassic, early Cretaceous mass extinction such as it was, was indeed something which wasn't driven by some external forcing factor. And I wouldn't have any quarrel with that at all. I know I, I, it seems to be entirely reasonable. The thing, though, which has sometimes been driven to, into this discussion, though, again, I'm not up to speed in this area, as with so many other areas, is that there is a sort of, if you like, an internal dynamic to this, where, the, as you mentioned earlier on about the market, whereby in itself, it, it's got a sort of chaotic aspect to it. And all I can say is that this is something which attracted a lot of attention quite a few years ago. And to the best of my reading, <clears throat> which is limited, has never really come up with anything very interesting. It's the sort of thing you can see why. And again, <clears throat> a little bit stepping back to our discussion about economics and its comparison to biology. But what I would say and again, I think we're echoing each other here, which is, you know, we all live in an echo chamber, don't we? We want to don't want to be anywhere else. No, no, no. Is that, and as I said myself, and nothing new about this, is that when we sapient form appears with self-knowledge and technology and all the rest of it, and this you can discuss when, when the seeds of this are, but I, I'm pretty sure it goes back at least 300,000 years. My guess is actually to older one times, but, you know, you can talk about that. All bets are off. Everything has changed forever, irreversibly, for better or worse. And <clears throat> I'm not so pessimistic about, you know, the future of biodiversity, because after all, if you're intelligent enough to eat it, you can be intelligent enough to preserve it. You know, there, there are powerful <laughs> reasons to actually, you know, <clears throat> keep things in good order. But in a way, you know, we, we have both a threat, yes, but we have a responsibility. You know, we, we shouldn't be embarrassed about this. I mean, we are as we are, you know. And and to imagine, as some people have suggested, that somehow we're a sort of, you know, a cancer, and that there are people who, you know, I must be careful what I say, and it's not going to get me many nice emails, but who would regard the world as far, far better without us here. I, I would firmly disagree. We are wonderful, and we may do damage, but we do great things as well. And indeed, as you know, I've pointed out, I mean, <clears throat> it's not universally true, and, and you mentioned in passing about animals don't have minds. I wouldn't put it like that. They don't have our sort of mind. 
Mm -hmm. But amongst the many curiosities of humans, and I think just standing out of ourselves is so very difficult, is, of course, we have pets. You know, not everybody, you know, some people are allergic, some, some of them hate them. But as I pointed out numerous times in the past, you know, what other species would think to introduce a carnivore full of parasites into a, into a household full of children? That's a dog. You know? And occasionally, of course, a dog, you know, they, they, they do bad things and it does happen. But for the most part, they are, well, at least dogs are. I'm not going to talk about cats at all for reasons I can't go into. But, you know, they are semi-symbiotic <laughs> with us. They, are, they make us, I think, by and large, not universally, better people. Not always, by any means. And, and, you know, you have people who talk to their goldfish. I have no trouble with that. Good for them. Some people talk to plants. I don't mind at all, you know. So there we are. I think we must almost draw a, a line under this conversation, if that's all right. Yeah. And, and, you know, not to try and dodge this final set of questions in, in uh, this volley of inquiry in, in any particular sort of way, but to insist that we're the people who are doing the thinking. And it's not animals don't do thinking. They do it in, a, I think, a pretty uninteresting way. But that's, that's fine. What they do, they need to do. Whereas, of course, as you know, both of us as scientists, apart from else, have this overwhelming curiosity about things. You know, it's passion to know. And it's passion to see patterns there, which may be completely illusory, but nevertheless, you know, are our sort of, you know, our fire. There we are. How's awesome. That? Simon, so just in closing, you give me the four-word answer. This show, two words, future fossils. We've spent the entire time talking about fossils. You've already made it fairly clear that all bets are off as far as the future is concerned. And yet there is this strong statement running through this book and, and this work in general about constraints and convergence. And so for me, the, the pressing constant question in my mind is if we take all of this, it seems as though we can say at least something about the future of the biosphere. We can say that there is, even if we run it off the rails, that there is a rail of some kind into the future. And when I had Henry G, and I'm sure you know, mm. Henry G of Nature, sure. uh, I had him on the show and he takes the last chapter of his book into some insane science fictional speculation. But it's a, again, it's a, it's a speculation about the future of the formation of ever more intricate interdependencies and symbiotic relationships and this sort of recombinant stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, as a, a gesture of my appreciation for all of the enormous contemplation and research and thought and everything that you've given this topic and for the time that you've spent with me on this episode, if in parting, you <laughs> have any thoughts about where this world is actually headed? Oh dear, <laughs> I'm I'm, fra I'm afraid to say in parentheses I, I haven't had I haven't read Henry's book. I've read some of his earlier books. I haven't read this one, so I should go and look at that last chapter straight away. My sense is, in the end, that the biosphere will be fine, but the way we are going to be will be utterly unlike anything we ever expected. Which sounds rather sort of messianic or you know apocalyptic or something. I don't mean it like that at all. It's just that. The, the, the potentialities of what we can do, not just in technology, I think actually in, in certain respects, you're talking about, you know, the internet and all this other sort of stuff. Actually, that, as we know, can be can be dangerous and destructive and, and the like. And, and, you know, it's it's powerful, but it's not without its risks. Rather, what I have more in mind is that I suspect that, you know, what our minds are capable of looking towards, I'm putting this as, as gently as possible, may well depend on a technology, because we always have, and it sounds extremely vague and all the rest of it. Uh, I, I think probably when we get to the next stage, we'll look back at it and say, well, of course, it's going to be like that. You know, what did we ever expect? But second guessing is a real problem. But very briefly, because I've got to get a drink in a minute. We got, yeah, dead right. You probably need one as well. I don't have any optimism for AI or anything like that. That's absolutely fine. They can carry on, but they, what they do, symbolic logic very well. They do nothing else of any interest whatsoever. They're hugely powerful of what we need, and we couldn't possibly work without them. But there's not a shred of imagination in them. They'll never write a novel, as various people have pointed out. If you gave them a line of poetry, they'd be completely at sea. Well, it wouldn't even be at sea. It would be meaningless. So this is not to down the people who do this sort of stuff. But I think the promissory notes there are due for a little bit of bringing in in that way. And we just got to remind ourselves that there are whole sets, and I'm just going to hint at this, and then you can find the off button as quickly as possible. There are <laughs> all sorts of stories about remarkable 
capacities for people of things which are technically impossible, which they could not have done, are physically out of this world, literally. And I, I can't put it more obscurely than that, can I? Good night. Well, that's that's the girls. future of the body. That's the yeah, if you Michael like, sure. Murphy, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. In a sense, yeah. There we go. Yeah, How's well, that? <laughs> that's great. Yes, the future is you know saints and superheroes. I'm for it. I hope so. Yes, exactly. Right. Okay. <laughs> It's been a pleasure. So I hope much. I'm not curtailing things, but it's been a pleasure to talk, obviously. Absolutely. No, I, I really <laughs> no, no, appreciate sure. the generosity. And I no, no, no. It's all right. No. Yes, if I've been retired, you know, and so forth. Lovely. Okay, well, I'll sign off if that's all right. Citations sure. and Lovely. curious. Okay, right. All right. Okay, it's been very nice to talk. Thanks for your time as well. All right. Thanks again for listening. Future Fossils is an independent, ad-free, entirely listener-supported program. If you believe in the work that I'm doing and you want to help see it thrive into the unimaginable future, then you can avail yourself of all of the backstage goodies at patreon.com slash Michael Garfield, or you can just leave a review at Apple Podcasts. That's more helpful than you know. Reach out to me personally at Michael Garfield on Twitter or Instagram and have a wonderful eon.